Waters and we are here at Wild Heart Farm which we're located here in Rim Rock, Arizona and we grow specialty cut flowers and uh, just garden to vase flower designs for everyday and special occasions. Today we're here to talk about pollinator habitat and creating pollinator habitat in your backyard. We were lucky enough to receive a grant from the Friends of the Verde River and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2020 in order to create this terrace habitat for pollinator garden. Our goal today is first of all to inspire you and hopefully you know give you some tools so that you can do this in your yard. So why are pollinators important? First of all, without them, we don't eat. A third of the food plants that we consume, like these delicious little strawberries, are the handiwork of pollinators. 88% of our flowering plants, in order for them to make seed and a next generation, then we actually need pollinators to do that service of making seeds. And they're not just bees, we're talking about moths, we're talking about bats, we're talking about um, hummingbirds and all kinds of butterflies. Especially in Arizona, our native plant diversity is very high. We're at about 3,500 species in our state and we have about 1,700 species of native bees. That's compared to 20,000 species worldwide. So we're really lucky because we can support this diversity with our plant communities and in our backyard. So one of the inf unfortunate things that's going on right now is that our pollinator populations are in decline and the monarchs have been listed on the endangered species list and this is due to our human actions, uh, use of pesticides and herbicides, the loss of habitat, you know, by just destroying habitat in general. Um, and then invasive species, um, out-competing natives are all some of the reasons why our pollinators are in decline. The good news is that we, as backyard gardeners, have a lot of potential to change this around uh, by creating habitat. And I want to talk to you about a couple of the different kinds of plants, you know, that are going to help bring pollinators back. Uh, one of the things we want to do is plant a very large diversity of plants. We want both host plants and nectar plants. Um, so host plants uh, specifically are what the butterflies need, and especially monarchs, they need milkweeds in order to, they lay their eggs on the milkweeds and then they actually um, rate, you know, the, in their larval stage, they eat the milkweed, the sap provides protection for them when they're very vulnerable. And then when they're flying from the north to the south, um, then that migration is fueled by nectar. And here, this last year, we had our first sighting of monarchs and we had hundreds of them and they were here for about a month and a half in September and October on their way back to Mexico and, and that was very exciting for us and one of the plants they loved or the plants they loved were zinnias which are non-native uh, and uh, Mexican torch sunflower or tithonia so that one was its their favorite plant sunflower family in general is a really good nectar source and there are a lot of native sunflower family plants that in Arizona that grow in the fall that um, including even those ro roadside sunflowers that are good for the for the monarch. Well, some really passive ways that you can actually bring bees and and pollinators into your into your backyard is by creating um, bee boxes. It made <laughs> this nesting bee log by just drilling a bunch of different holes in um, a, a log with different sizes of uh, drill bits. Um, a lot of our native bees are ground nesters, so having some bare ground uh, for them and then not disturbing the ground is important. One of the other great pollinator um, additives that you can do in your garden is letting your herbs go to flower and go to seed. So here we have a great patch of cilantro which is a cool season herb and we it grows really with abandon here all winter and then it starts getting you know too hot and it starts going to seed but it has um, a, as you can see on on these there's so much activity and 
a lot of native bees and smaller insects and the beneficial insects that prey on aphids um, love to be on these plants. Uh, plants in the carrot family, like this Queen Anne's lace, and uh, say dill uh, and um, fennel are also great hosts for wallowtail butterflies in their larval stage, especially those of us that have pastures or big meadows, is that we can follow this really simple mowing guideline where we mow we don't mow we mow before March 1st and after November 1st so those are the times when there aren't going to be larvae and there aren't going to be caterpillars and there aren't going to and and that can food that nectar source can be available for the monarchs so one of the things um, that we can also do is okay so say we wanted to mow we can mow in patches so we could keep patches if you have to mow mow in patches so that you have a good patch size available for habitat and then switch off and alternate so that you're not mowing everything at once so that there's still food and nectar and habitat um, for the different times of year. So our mission at Wild Heart Farm is to nourish body and spirit with flowers but also connect people with the beauty and wisdom of nature and that's Really for us, it, it's great growing cut flowers, but it breaks our hearts also to cut them. So having these pollinator gardens is a really important part of our mission. And um, just, it helps us be happy, <laughs> really, and, um, and know that we're doing something more in the world that is um, healing these, these fractured ecosystems. You can start a pollinator garden just by spreading seeds. So this we actually did in um, on March 21st. So this is a basically three months. Something that's really important about growing a garden in general is you have to start with the soil and sometimes it takes multiple seasons to actually enliven it. And so this is a cover crop where we have grown, it's called a good bug mix. So it has herbs in it. It has um, these uh, mustards, which we're actually getting ready to cut this down when it's all flowering. With a cover crop, you cut it down. And then um, all of the, like with these clovers and some of the bee, the, the, that family of legume, all of that goes back, nitrogen goes back into the soil. Having moist ground, uh, moist soil is an important part of feeding butterflies. So if you have just a small patch, um, a little shallow dish of water. So we have water put out in different places um, for bees and butterflies, but it can't be too deep. But this is where we can let um, herbs go to seed. We're also growing some wheats that are also gonna be good food, um, fennel. Uh, one of our favorite plants right now uh, is the scorpion weed. This is a, a wonderful bee plant of all, all kinds of bees and butterflies, love it. And it's very fast growing and uh, we can even cut it and put it in bouquets. Of course, the California poppy is a favorite. In uh, the evening, it's good to have the primroses for the moths. So we have a primrose, we're working on growing our primroses, which bloom at night. So remembering your night bloomers uh, for the moths, like sacred datura for the hummingbird moth. So one of the things that is really great about having a, attracting a diverse array of pollinators is having shade. So creating shade is great. We're lucky we have a lot of mulberries and a lot of giant ash trees, uh, but we are capitalizing on having some shade gardens. This is golden columbine, a beautiful native that grows naturally in stream sides and shady habitats. So really you wanna start thinking like a forest, you know, or thinking like, um, you know, some wild patch. If you have a big sunny open spot, well, create like a desert wildflower meadow. You know, here we were like, okay, we're going for a nice stream side habitat here. And we've got the dogwoods and, um, and uh, peonies and, and uh, some uh, like native grasses in here. Um, and I guess I would say in closing, you know, just that this is, this is a process that takes many years and I would not give up the first year. If you have little success, you've got to start 
you know, wherever you are and start with seeds, start with plants and continue planting and continue um, to grow, you know, your space and learn from your mistakes. That's what we do. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed uh, our little tour and uh, good luck. Yay. Listening to the Verde is brought to you by Friends of the Verde River. Please visit verderiver.org backslash listening for more videos and resources.